And uh, yeah, and now we are live broadcasting around the world, both of us from Manhattan. Welcome to the Gamification Revolution. I'm your host, Gabe Zickerman, and I'm here today with uh, Robert Torres from the Gates Foundation. Hi, Robert. Hey, Gabe. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I am so glad that you were here, and I'm glad that all of, uh, all of you are with us. You can uh, come and see me and Robert and uh, 50 or 60 other or so folks at Gamification Summit this April. You can find out more about it at gsummit.com. And of course, um, you can ask questions of Robert or me and even come on camera if you have the technology uh, by clicking on those buttons that say submit a question or come on camera. They could be on any side of your screen. I don't know what your screen looks like, but click those buttons and we'll uh, try to get your questions answered uh, today at some point while we're talking. And so Robert, I wanna talk to you a little bit. You are now deeply, deeply involved in the question of how to create engagement uh, in education, and this is uh, something we're going to talk about your work and, and talk about your vision for stuff. So can you tell me what it is that the, uh, the Gates Foundation, what is its uh, focus, what is its strategy around education? What's your responsibility there? So our focus around uh, education is, and strategy is pretty large. I lead um, two strategies. Um, one of them around games for learning and assessment. That's the name of the strategy, games for learning and assessment. And we have been investing um, in this strategy it almost as similar to how the field has evolved. So the, there's been kind of a, a, a pretty active um, uh, field for about 10 years in the games um, and learning space. Um, and about five years ago, the field um, began to realize that, gee, games may not only be interesting environments for learning, but they may be really um, good environments and interesting environments for assessment. Um, so our strategy is really pushing um, via games on this issue of, of high engagement, but also um, assessment. Um, how do we really move the needle on assessment, and, and, it's, and it's an important question for us because assessments really drive what happens in education, like it's sort of the engine behind. So, so the way that tests are made really kind of um, gives you, gives teachers a lot of guidance around how to design their instruction. Um, so, it's yeah. So this is a question that keeps coming. So it's really interesting that you divide education and assessment. I've spent this whole week for some reason talk about gamification of ed, and I'm you know, thrilled that you're here for many reasons. Um, but so one of my questions for you, just to start with, in this new era where information is freely available to anybody at any time at the, under their fingertips, and with all the kind of questions that get asked about the role of games in education, and let's say also um, in assessment, um, are we measuring, are we at all measuring the right stuff when we quiz kids on like when the battle of 1812 happened? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so a really good question. We, we are interested in assessing um, two types of things. Um, one of them is, um, you know, some traditional school content, especially there, there are these standards um, that have been recently adopted by many states and they're called the common core state standards and so we're particularly interested in assessing skills and knowledge um, relative to those standards um, and um, and and in li on the literacy side they're certainly not uh, fact toys right they're not fact driven as the kind of uh, factoid that you that you just mentioned um, and they, they are more about how you do um, investigation, say, like how do you actually decipher what is credible evidence within a text? So um, the Common Core, and, and that's a really big shift for us as a country, that there are a set of standards that are really pushing on this issue of textual evidence, for example. So we, we want to be able to assess Common Core-based skills. Um, and um, we, we also want to assess more what we call complex skills. So how well can you collaborate with someone? How well, um, 
how well can you um, enter a space and really figure out how to solve a problem? What are the skills that you put in place to figure out the, solve, the, the problem solving necessary in, in a particular context? And also, we're really interested in this issue of persistence and tenacity. And so we are also assessing how tenacious um, may you have been as you solve a problem. And we're also really interested in giving that data back to kids um, to use to learn from. So we think that data itself can be motivating, right? That as you're getting constant and immediate feedback, that that itself is guiding your learning and also making you more strategic about how you learn. So we have a lot of questions already queued up for you, uh, Robert. So I want to yeah. uh, make sure that folks get a chance to ask them. And, and I have tons for you as well. So here we have a first question from Evan. Thanks for the question, Evan. And um, I'm getting to some of these others in a second. So how do you actually measure knowledge? And let me, let me just add kind of one question for you. As somebody who's deeply experienced in the use of games in education, yeah. are, they, are games or gamification approaches in education are they helping raise people's level of knowledge? So, so two different questions, right? So I'll, I'll take the first one first, um, which is how do we measure? So this is such an important question um, because we, if, we're, if we're saying that games are uh, maybe good assessment tools or instruments, then we um, really have to make sure that our measures um, are accurate. So um, we are working with psychometricians. Um, our, our work is, this is what I get to do um, for a living, which, which is really awesome, um, which is to bring together like top game designers and top psychometricians. So psychometricians are people who measure, who measure things, who measure learning. And, and they together um, figure out um, first how to collaborate and speak the same language, um, but, the, but, but also how to, uh, on the psychometric side is um, they have to create, say, a measure, um, you know, figure out how to, how to determine whether somebody learned something, and then they have to take it through a process of determining its validity and reliability. And so um, that's really so those measures are really really important if we're going to make claims um and then we we embed those so those measures those validated measures into the game so we code them in if you will um so that the game knows how to collect the kind of evidence the kind of information that we know uh, so that we can make a determination as to whether you are a good systemic reasoner um, if you can solve a, a chemistry problem well. Um, so, but creating those indicators and those measures actually takes an enormous amount of work. And, and, if, we're, if, and if they're gonna be credible, we have to go through a lot of testing. So we work with ETS. Um, we have folks from ETS partnering with folks at, um, at the Institute of Play and together, they have created a lab at EA called Glass Lab, um, which is one of our largest projects. Um, and they are doing just that. It's uh, learning scientists and, and game designers and um, assessment experts together um, creating games or modding existing EA titles. And so the, so the first thing, if I just to distill that down, it sounds like it's not only important to identify what it is that we want to measure, but then it sounds like it's critically important to make sure that the games or interventions, whatever the pedagogy is, is then set up to correctly measure the thing that we said we were going to measure in the first place, which is an interesting uh, right. kind of bit that, that often, escapes, um, often escapes us. But before I bring the next question on, uh, back to mine, are, are games actually improving outcomes when we talk about knowledge? So, so you know, it's it's uh, that that question. I have to tell you, um, in my career, um, has always I've always figured out how do I answer that gracefully because we still don't have sufficient data. So I should say that uh, I should say that first of all, um, all of our work um, at at the Gates Foundation is you know, research oriented. So we are trying to collect data 
on our work and, and seeing if our hypothesis that games can be useful tools for learning is actually true. Um, but today, I don't have to be so, um, you know, so graceful, if you will, or how do, how, do, how do I dodge that question? Because we have just completed a, a, a meta study. And while I can't share the exact results um, just yet, because we're going through um, uh, various channels to make sure that we communicate correctly, et cetera, um, we've just finished a, a meta analysis, which means that some 61,000 studies were considered in this meta-analysis, right? Studies of whether um, games can actually have an impact on learning. Um, and, and those were um, filtered down through various means and the, the results are really promising. Um, I am, you know, I was almost saying, God, I could lose my job and my whole career, uh, you know, could be, uh, could, could take a turn if this meta-analysis uh, is it encouraging? But so I'm I'm super excited, and we'll be sharing the the actual results soon. Maybe even at the gamification conference, um, if if we can, uh, you know, give you more granular uh, um, information about that. But I what I can tell you is that it's uh, it's pretty exciting the results. That's, that's super exciting, and I'm excited to hear it. And I have more questions for you about that and about outcomes, and there's yeah. lots of stuff queued up. So I just wanted to bring Seamus on. Welcome back, Seamus. Thank Thanks. You. What's your uh, What's your question Thank for Robert you. today? Good morning, or good afternoon, Robert, and good afternoon, Gabe. Thanks for having me on again. Uh, my question: uh, the company that I used to work for, we focused in on whether or not gameplay uh, using metacognition and metacognitive problem solving could then transfer the game strategy into specific academics. Now, we found that this was extremely helpful for improving uh, overall academics, but of course, a lot of our initial studies of our program was about uh, whether or not it would improve standardized test scores. Now, a lot of that was outdated, so we needed to kind of um, boost things up a bit and do some new studies. We focused in on the formative assessment as opposed to the summative using those metacognitive processing skills and with the formative assessment needs be able to uh, show that the transference was occurring and that the uh, students uh, standardized tests were improving. Uh, I know that standardized tests need to kind of bring in more formative assessment, but I was wondering if uh, you guys have had any experience with that, uh, with what you're doing. Yes. So just for a little context, the issue of transfer in um, cognitive psychology is very hairy, right? So it's a it's a it's an enormous yes. issue that and and there are many many papers and debates um, that have been documented and many papers written about the issue of how difficult it is to actually measure transfer. That said, um, we have four. Okay, if you will, um, for um, in, in our research work, and, and I said to Gabe earlier that we our, our work is really research driven. We're we're trying to gather evidence, and one of the one of our um, foci is on transfer, on the issue of transfer. One of our projects is especially focused on this issue, and it's and it's Zoran Popovich's project out of the University of Washington. Zoran um, was one of the creators um, of Foldit. He created Foldit, um, and um, and he's now creating a series of uh, of math games where where kids are moving from different spaces, from different games, literally, to see if they can transfer what they've learned in one game space to another game space. So we're actively doing research in that space. Um, so, so game to game it, transfer from and, and transfer for just for the audience is the the issue of being able to move to to see if you can apply what you've learned in one context to another um so um so we're actively all, all i can say is that we're, we're it's a question for us um and to see if students can transfer what they've learned for in a game context to a different context um sometimes completely different kind of context, like a non-game context or and or another digital context. Um, so it's- That was really my- Yeah. Basis. Yeah. 
So thank it's, you, Seamus. I, that was my uh, big concern is, yeah, I'm sorry, Gabe. No, no, I was just going to say thanks for the question. We're going to uh, move on a little bit, but it's really interesting. Yeah, so transfer not totally clear yet. Uh, thanks so much, Seamus. I'm yeah. sure we'll see you again soon. Thanks Probably. for coming on. Um, so, Robert, this. Hi. It, sorry about you're that. Back. Great. A little glitch in the matrix. Okay. A little glitch in the matrix, yeah, everyone. No, no problem. Um, but so, sorry, just to come back to you. So, we've had, you know, 10 years uh, in the contemporary discussion, and, you know, we're just now maybe seeing some meta research that brings it together and so many unanswered questions. So, can I, can I take us back? Let's take us back for one second. You've worked on two of the most seminal projects in the gamification of education, uh, Quest to Learn and GameStar Mechanic. And I, I want to know, um, can, you, can you tell everybody a little bit about the, uh, let's start with Quest to Learn for a second. What is Quest to Learn and what's currently going on with it? So Quest to Learn is a school um, where the entire curriculum of the school um, is designed between game designers and teachers so that um, you move through the curriculum, um, some of it which is um, mediated by actual video games or by, by, uh, by digital um, learning tools, but you move through the entire curriculum um, um, as if you were moving through a game. So they're structured as missions and quests. So um, uh, a particular uh, a miss, missions are usually ten weeks long, and you you move through quests through um, during that time. And at the end of the missions, there are uh, there's a boss level, um, and 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 here kids are kind of uh, it's 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 pretty remarkable, and you can see some of the school's boss levels online because they're always documented. Um, Kids are kind of on their own for almost two weeks. Um, so you can imagine a group of, you know, sixth graders and seventh graders. Now, now we have sixth through ninth graders um, kind of on their own, figuring out with each other how to solve some complex problem. So that and, and, and the curriculum in general is always um, as as a good game does poses some problem to solve. Right. Um, and so and boss levels go for about two weeks and then the at the end of those two weeks um real folks from real industries from architecture to engineering come and judge and it's off and it's often fields like those come and judge student products um so that's in essence the school this it also has a particular focus on um a particular set of skills related to systems thinking um, and systemic reasoning. So that also is infused throughout the school. But um, it's a pretty awesome project that's doing well. Um, so kids, if we look at traditional test scores, which unfortunately we have to, right? Yeah. Um, even though they're not great measures, um, we're seeing that kids at Quest to Learn are scoring on those tests slightly better than um, than um, kids in, in similar demographics. More important um, to me and to the folks at Quest to Learn is that kids are doing um, other things that are more indicative of, of how well um, the school is doing. So for example, um, the school has won the Math Olympics. Um, oh, cool. um, so, so that's a real, where they actually get to apply what they've learned. And you know, in the Math Olympics in New York, um, it is a pretty big deal. You're going up against kids who, you know, who are math whizzes. And so, and we don't recruit math whizzes. You don't, you don't take a test to get into Quest to Learn. Um, and so it's, you know, th those kinds of things are pretty remarkable. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, I mean, one question I'm going to, uh, we're going to grab this question from Stephen Dahlberg in a second, but one question that I have for you is, you know, which often comes up is, you know, is this kind of faddish in a way? Like when you talk about, when you say like a school based, you know, around a kind of highly gamified curriculum, don't many people say, well, this is really faddish. Like, do we need all of this stuff? Why do we need any of this? Yeah, by the way, I should say that there's a second quest to learn that I, I didn't, um, the model was uh, moved and adopted in Chicago. So there's a one there. And I, and I've, I've, I, I had nothing to do with that. Um, 
school, though they're using our the, the design that Katie Salin um, yeah. and I created um, and there and the design document was published by MIT and is available. Um, but um, is it a fad? Um, you know, I think our interest in this work is more about learning. And if I dare say less about games, right? So that we're in the game space because there's something particular about these environments that allow us to do and create learning environments that are the kinds of learning environments we want to be creating for kids so that they're so that they're deep. They're, there's you step into a problem space and you're certainly and you're suddenly in some sort of deep place where you have to apply skill and knowledge. Um, many of us in the games and learning space have, have always said it's not about um, playing video games, but it's about making learning more game-like, right? So that there is an immersive way, that there is a, that a, a sense of, of competition, a sense of collaboration, all of the things that games can do well. Um, and it's also that games do this other thing uniquely well, which is that they find the sweet spot um, between something that is too difficult um, and, and, and not difficult enough, right? So that a good game um, is really designed to adapt to the learner in, in those ways. Um, so is it a fad? You know, if, if we didn't have um, game-based schools anymore, that's okay, actually. But if we can have an impact on what uh, learning should look like, um, which I think we are having that impact, um, then um, that'd be great. And um, speaking of the impact, you can uh, you know come and see uh, Robert and uh, and me, and we'll talk more about gamification of education, and learning uh, games in this context and outside of it at G Summit in San Francisco this April. There's a little code there that Ivan's put down, GREV, um, which you can enter at gsummit.com to get a discount on your pass and uh, come join the fun there. Um, on a, on a kind of related note to this, which is, you know, we've been talking about the power of games and the immersive experience, what they can, what they can't do, this idea that we're just trying to, you know, uh, create more opportunity for students. Um, Stephen asked this great question, Stephen Dahlberg asked, what about um, creativity and the need to bring engagement to help people, you know, expand their creativity? Um, do we care about that? And if so, what do we know about our ability to, to help spur more creativity using these models? So, Absolutely. Um, you know, games um, also create a space for creating and for sharing um, things that you create. So uh, I'm not sure that I fully follow the question, but, you know, we, we want kids to be producers versus consumers. You know, sometimes you, you, you have to consume knowledge so that you can be a better producer, but but we are really driven, Quest to Learn, for example, um, is driven by the question, um, what if we were creating, wh what does it mean to create the next um, generation of innovators? What kinds of things might they be learning? What does it mean to develop an inventor and an innovator? So, the, so we think that games actually allow us to more readily create the kinds of environments where kids are tinkering, where they're taking risks, where they're making mistakes, where they're using that um, in their artillery for actually um, making better things. Um, and so making and inventing and tinkering, which are all um, critical elements of creativity, are central to this work, very much so. So in, in Game Star Mechanic, right, is really, uh, feels yeah. like it's more targeted at that kind of idea, right? Can you talk about Game Star Mechanic for a second? Sure. So, um, so Game Star Mechanic um, is a game that um, teaches you how to be a game designer. Um, and yeah. right, exactly. Uh, so um, you go on a series of missions and quests, and you level up in your skill as. Um, as a game designer, and so, so, and, and I'll sort of break down a little bit what what 
what GameStar is also a really great example of, a, of an awesome learning environment. So um, when I was doing um, my research in, um, in GameStar, um, there were 600 kids um, at, at the same time who were part of the, not my study, but there were my kids in my, in New York, uh, in, the, in the class that I was leading were interacting with these 600 kids on a national level. So what, cre what became was this community of practice where kids were immersed in a problem space of creating sets of games and they were given challenges as to how to, to design certain types of games. And then they would post them and kids would give feedback and critique each other on the, on, on a set of criteria. We had 10 criteria and we had rubrics for the kids on how to give feedback to each other. And so they would give feedback and they would also cast votes on who. And so it was really fascinating to see the level of engagement, the, you know, how this environment became irresistible for them in terms of creating, but also in terms of getting feedback. And every day, the leaderboards were the first thing kids, kids were really concerned about, you know, where am I on the leaderboard? Um, and, you know, it was th that experience, especially that made me think, how do we create similar conditions? Imagine that we were creating that the, that the, that the subject at hand was not game design, but um, biology, that we needed to solve some complex problems in biology. Um, and bio, you know, bi Fold It is certainly a biochemistry game. That's your so right. solving problems in that space, you know, right. and, and it has a lot of the same mechanics. Um, you know, you can collaborate, you give each other feedback, you, there are leaderboards, you know, and so it creates these really, and, and Fold It is throwing at you some really complex problems, as I'm sure you know, Gabe, that other scientists haven't been able to solve. Right. So, yeah. So um, GameStar is, is just that, a, 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 a game in which there is a large community of practice that you play with and share with as you level up in your game design skills. So this is a discussion. Thanks for that great question, Stephen. A discussion that's going on here in the chat is about learning to learn or learning. You know, some people talk about the love of learning. Yeah. Are, are games or game-based modalities better at creating a love of learning or helping people learn how to learn than other um, than other approaches? I don't know. You're right. We we are. That would be uh, as a, as a researcher. I I I wouldn't make that claim yet because we don't know. Right? Can is will games create a deeper and greater sense of love of learning? Um, what we do know is that the best game, like if a game does not make you love it, right? So if EA um, and Nintendo, et cetera, do not make a game that you don't come to really appreciate um, and really kind of love enough to stick with for quite some time so you can beat it, those companies wouldn't be successful. Right. They would flop. So, so, so don't you think that most educational game makers, and I don't want I don't want to call anybody particularly out here, but if you look at the last like 30 years of education focused games, have they really held themselves to that standard? Because I don't think they have. They have not. Absolutely, Why? they have not. Why not? So I think our, our, it's good that you said earlier we this is not the this is not this is the contemporary sort of iteration on this issue of games and learning because we've had prior ones. Um, and, um, and what, it, you know, this is great term that folks use, you know, chocolate on broccoli, right? So if it smells of school, you know, we can't really fool kids into uh, thinking that because it's a game um, and you, and you, um, you know, sort of put a layer of learning on it of educational content that they're going to like it. And so, this iteration of, of the field, if you will, has really looked at the principles. It's, it has started with the principles of successful games. Um, and that's where we, we sort of started. So, so, you know, Jim G's great book, What uh, Do Games Have to Teach Us About Learning and Literacy, really breaks that down, breaks that down into 36 principles that, he, and he does not, 
use any educational game to take us through the principles. And, and in fact, and, and instead he uses, you know, highly successful commercial games. So that's, that's, a, that's our starting place. Um, and it's part of the reason why we're at EA, working with EA game designers. And it's certainly the challenge of the game designers to, to figure out how to make, um, you know, math, math algebra um, as irresistible as Halo. Um, that's, a, that's a really it's great harder. design, right? It's a great yeah. design challenge. And that's what we love as game designers. We, we, you know, we love hard challenges, but, um, but that is the, t that is the thing to solve for this issue so of irresistibleness. Yeah. And I, I, to me, it's just like the thing that's constantly burning a hole in my head. Like, why aren't we doing more of that? So I get this last question from Bunny and then some exciting news for everybody. Uh, this last question comes from Bunny Lebowski. A great question, Bunny. And one that I keep talking about, I talk about it out loud. I think about it in my head all the time. So. We know that games are great learning tools if used the right way. They certainly teach people, they certainly engage people um, often and they expose them to different ideas. So are games that are violent uh, better than at um, you know, exposing people to violence? Or I, I tend to think of it as if a game is a great training tool, in one hand, um, it may not make someone violent, which is the question we keep, the thing that people keep accusing games of doing, but won't it help train somebody to be, to be better at violence? So the, the, the data around um, kids and violence um, is pretty inconclusive that they will um, train, that they will uh, create greater violent tendencies. Um, but, or at least that's what most of my colleagues would say. I'll tell you that on a personal note, I myself have written that if it if it's going to teach you something that's useful, and um, why couldn't it teach you something that's not useful if they're the, if we're using the same mechanics? So we know that the Ku Klux Klan, for example, actually created a game to train their um, their recruits. So that game Who's exists. Now? Mm -hmm. hmm. um, so so. You know, and we're trying to make games where kids are solving, you know, chemistry problems or um, or or math problems. And so um, I think that that what we're seeing from the research is that kids who, um, you know, and, and we, we have the, the most recent terrible tragedy to, to look at. And, and that kid, um, Adam Lanza, was really into violent video games. But what we're seeing is that the context around them um, is 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 you know is is also was also highly problematic. Or I mean, for this kid, you know, he he had um, so many emotion other emotional issues. But that kids who um, are playing a lot of video games, a lot of violent video games, um, and acting out on them have also all of these other reinforcers, you know, from their home life to, you know, that sort of result in that and then they gravitate to those. So, because we're also seeing the vast majority of kids who are playing violent video games are not, not acting out in that way at all. Right. So, right. so that's, you know, so the data is more of a, overwhelming on that side than it is uh, in supporting kids' violent behaviors. Uh, and so I think I think one of the conclusions that I've taken from today's super interesting chat is that you know we've got uh, some new research coming out, which hopefully we'll have in time for G Summit in April. Um, but there's still you know lots of uh, insight for us to glean, lots of lots more research that needs to be done, and some yes. key areas in which uh, you know games and education are already having an impact. Uh, and so we've been talking to uh, Robert Torres from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, and uh, you know, deeply experienced in the contemporary gamification education discussion. Uh, you can follow uh, Robert on Twitter. It's Rob J. Torres, right, on Twitter? Yes, thank you, yep. And, um, and also you can come see Robert and me and a bunch of other folks at Gamification Summit this April. You can use the code GREV to register for it and save uh, some money on uh, your pass. That's gsummit.com. And also, I wanted to take a moment to announce that uh, starting in two weeks' time, we're going to do a new feature here on the show where we're going to, um, if you've got a startup 
and your startup is using gamification in some interesting way and you'd like to get feedback from the experts, you can uh, submit your startup and get enough votes from the community and we'll bring you on uh, the gamification revolution uh, once a week and uh, you, you can have a few minutes with me and the expert that we've got on board and they'll uh, give you direct feedback on uh, your design and get your ideas, uh, get some ideas flowing in your direction. So hopefully help you out. Be sure to go to gamification.co slash live uh, to enter your startup and find out more about what we're doing. Uh, again, thank you so much, Robert, for joining us today. Uh, and thank you all for tuning into the Gamification Revolution. I'm your host, Gabe Zickerman. Keep having fun. Thanks, See you, Robert. Gabe.